Very good to see you all this morning. Begin with the idea of what's happening in our nation right now. It's very sad to see, very disturbing. I know it is to me, I know it is to others to whom I've spoken. You can see that on social media, how many people are lamenting what is unfolding right now. We see a lot of anger and violence, a lot of wrath that's coming out in people's behavior, in their words. We see a lot of hatred and even oppression being directed toward things that many of us would agree are principles and people that are trying to stand up for what is right. And that bothers us. We see in our nation a degrading of the culture and all types of wickedness that not only seems to exist but is promoted and celebrated. And again, that is something that saddens us. But the reality is there's nothing new under the sun. It's not as though we are the first generation to face these kinds of things. If you back all the way up to the book of Genesis and you look at the time of Noah and what was happening in his day and how that the earth was filled with violence and God brought judgment against the world because of the great wickedness that existed then. When we think about oppression, the oppression or the persecution of the righteous, that stretches back to nearly the very beginning when you think about how Cain slew his brother Abel in Genesis 4. And you go through the Bible story and you realize that the oppression, the suppression, the persecution of the righteous is a major theme throughout the Bible going all the way down into the book of Revelation where, for instance, in chapter 2, it talks about the saints at Smyrna, how that they were going to be imprisoned. So there is a persecution that has existed in this world as long as really the world has been around. And as we live in a culture, in a society like this, as we strive to do what's right, we need to make sure that we have the faith that endures that we have a faith that would cause us to stand apart from the world around us. When they are filled with the anger, the wrath, the violence, that we don't go down that path. That when there is oppression, when there's persecution, when there are attacks against the righteous and even against us individually and personally, that we have a faith that is going to be able to cause us to stand firm in the face of that type of opposition. To help us with this, we want to study one who faced these kinds of things, faced particularly oppression. If you go back to Daniel chapter 6, we want to study about Daniel and what he faced in his lifetime and how his example can encourage us and inspire us that we would be strong and firm and true to the Lord. You recall that Daniel and others were taken away captive when Babylon went in and they invaded Judah. They took many people away, including Daniel and his three friends in that original captivity, that wave of captivity. They were taken away and Daniel and his friends began to serve in the Babylonian government. They were trained in that. They served faithfully for many years. In chapter 5, it tells us how that the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians, and then they are now the power that controls the area. And we understand then that Daniel remained as a servant of the government that existed. In Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we want to read down through verse 9, and notice what he's doing in this government and what begins to unfold here. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, 
that the satraps might give account to them so that the king should suffer loss or would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave no thought to setting him over the whole realm. Or the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or any man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. In this account here, we see where Daniel's enemies are scheming against him. They're doing this because as it begins there, it tells us that Darius trusted and respected Daniel. It talks about how that Darius and his rule being under the Persian king Cyrus, if you recall at the time, that Darius is over the kingdom of Babylon that they have just conquered. And it's divided up into this 120 provinces. And over each one of those, he has a governor or a ruler that would oversee those things, the satraps, the administrators, if you will. And then above them are three governors. So those three governors oversee the 120, and those three governors report to the king. It says that they are there in order to look after the king's best interest so that the king would suffer loss in nothing. And as the king is looking at this and he's getting to know these people who are working for him in his kingdom, he sees that Daniel stands above the rest of them. So he's thinking about and considering appointing Daniel over all of the realm. And for us, maybe to put it in our terms, he's really thinking about making Daniel a prime minister. He would be the one in charge, answerable only to the king. Now, these other officials, of course, envied Daniel, and they began to look for a fault in him. And you can imagine what these men are doing. They're probably talking to people who work around Daniel, and they want to know, how does Daniel behave? What types of things does he do? Is he a selfish man? Does he look out for his own self-interest? Is he somebody who's taking bribes? Is he showing favoritism? What types of things is he doing? Is he taking a little off the top for himself? Exactly what it is that what is it that Daniel is doing here? So they're looking for some way in his governorship that he's corrupt. Where's the fault in this man? Because surely there's a fault in every man. Well, they search through all these things, they do their investigation, and they come up with nothing. There is no fault in his behavior, there is no fault in the finances and the, the things that he's in charge of. But what they do is they recognize that he has a great faith in God. And it's really that faith in God that made Daniel a faithful servant to the king. And we understand that anyone who is a faithful child of God is an excellent servant to the government or to a business or in any realm because they are people who have respect and honesty and integrity. And that's coming out in Daniel's life and these men are recognizing that Daniel lives by that standard. A standard where he worships God in heaven. And so his enemies go to the king and they manipulate the king. And they really lie to him when saying, well, we've all discussed this, all the governors, verse 7, of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, so everybody's on board with this. And you need to write a decree that there can only be petitions and prayers to you, king, for 30 days and to no others. Now, in part, this is appealing to Darius's vanity. 
Well, yeah, I would like that. Everybody appeals to me. Another part that this is probably playing into is the fact because he's a new ruler and over these people that is helping to reinforce the idea that he's the one that's in charge. So everybody has to come to me. But be that as it may, they say, you need to write this. No one can petition anyone except you, O king, for 30 days. And the penalty is going to be that they are thrown into the den of lions. And because they were under the Persian system, there was no changing that. There was no altering of that decree. Once it went out, it was in force. So Darius agrees to that. And we want to notice now verses 10 through 17 and what unfolds and how Daniel reacts to that. In Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. It's very interesting to me in verse 10, it says, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. Daniel knew what the law was. He knew what the penalty was. He knew that the law could not be changed. And that if he went ahead as he had done before, that he would be thrown into the lion's den. He knew that would happen. So when he goes into that upper room and he opens up those windows to Jerusalem and he kneels down and he prays, notice that his enemies are there watching. They knew Daniel would do this because they knew about his conviction. So they're watching, they're waiting, and they're very eager. So they run back and they report this to the king. And then when they report it to the king, you notice the first thing that they did is that they said, remember king that the law that you pass and how that it can't change. And then they tell him, oh, by the way, Daniel has violated your law. And the way that they put it is that Daniel does not show due regard for you. Daniel did not have in mind when he went up to pray, well, I'm rebelling against the king. Well, I am angry with the king for signing this. And so I'm going to do it despite him. That wasn't Daniel's motive at all. Daniel's motive was to go and to pray to God as he had always done. But they frame it like, well, Daniel's being rebellious toward you. And so the king then, when he hears this, verse 14, he's greatly displeased. I would say he was distraught over this because all of a sudden he realized the error that he had made. He realizes, I shouldn't have done that. I should never have signed that law. And so he begins to look for a way to deliver Daniel. He's looking for some type of loophole. Now, I don't know if he's telling his people to go and search the archives and find out, is there any way at all that I can get around this? Is there any loophole in the law? Is there any legal precedence here that I can have Daniel spared from being thrown to the lion's den? Because if you recall, Daniel at this time is over 80 years old. And he's a faithful servant the servant that the king was thinking about putting over all of the kingdom. 
He says there's got to be some way to get around this, but there was no way out. So he issued the order. They went and they got Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. They seal that up with a king's signet ring and also with those of his lords to make sure that no one had tampered with it to get Daniel out, but that the penalty would be in place there. Let's go on and read verses 18 down through 24 now. It says, Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Daniel is delivered here. We see that the king spent that night in a very restless state. It says he did not eat. He was fasting. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. That no musicians were brought before him. You know, sometimes when we're upset, we want to be distracted. We want to be entertained. And there is an element where that music can soothe us and calm us down. And what it's saying is the king could not be satisfied with anything. Don't bring the musicians in. It's not going to help. And sometimes we are so upset it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter the music playing or what we may try to watch or what people may say to us. It's not going to take care of the problem. And that's what's happened with the king here. He is thoroughly upset about what has happened. Well, he comes to the lion's den and he calls out to Daniel in the hope that he is still there, that he is alive. And of course, Daniel responds. And Daniel responded, notice, in a very respectful way. He's not holding a grudge against the king. He realizes the king was duped into doing this. And the king really never meant Daniel any harm. So Daniel is not bitter. Daniel is not angry at the king. But Daniel simply expresses the fact that he has great faith in God. He says, verse 22, because I was found innocent before him. I've not done anything wrong. I've lived a righteous life. And so the Lord has delivered me. He sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. And he also says, I've done no wrong before you. I've not done anything against you either, king. Yeah. And me being delivered is proof of that. So, the king then gives a decree, gives an order. He doesn't sign a law like he did with Daniel before. He just says, go get the men, get their wives, get their children, throw them all into the lion's den. They throw them in. And they're all eaten up by the lions. They're torn to pieces by the lions. By the way, that tells you that the lions were hungry. Right? They were hungry. It wasn't like the lions were in there. They're just lazy. They're lethargic. They're not doing anything. And that's why Daniel survived. That's not why Daniel survived. He survived because God intervened on his behalf. And when people are thrown over in there, they attack the people and they tear them to pieces. Now then, let's draw some lessons out of this. Backing up to verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We want when people see our lives, the way that we live, the way that we behave, whether it's in the community, in business, wherever, we want them to see that our fault is serving God. 
that we don't have those other faults that men have, lie and cheat and steal, but when they see us, that that is, quote, if you will, our fault. We have to offer faithful service to both God and man. As 2 Corinthians chapter 8 points out, as Paul is referring to himself and those who would serve the Lord, it says, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That we would be good servants. We would be good employees and good employers. We would be good neighbors and good friends to other people. And if people came and they examined our life and they tried to dig up the dirt, they would not find any dirt. But what they would find is that we are wholly committed to the Lord. Now sometimes that means people get angry because anytime you stick to a rigid standard of right and wrong and you live that out in your life, people will be angry at that. They will envy you, they will despise you, and they will try to destroy you. That's what they're doing with Daniel here. We need to live in a way that our faith stands out just as Daniel's faith stood out. But then notice also verse 10 again. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Daniel was ordered to stop doing what was right. Stop. You can't do that anymore. You can't pray to God anymore. So the order from the king was stop doing what God would have you to do. He's not told to do something sinful in and of itself. Like in Daniel chapter 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to go and bow down to the idol, that's one form of of sin. But when Daniel is told not to do something, that's another form of sin. Not to do something that he should have done. And this is the idea of suppression and oppression. In fact, it's the most common probably in our society. Don't do what is right. Some 15 years ago or so now, when I was preaching up in Kentucky, we had a um, newspaper article that came out in the paper, the Courier Journal, every week. And I wrote an article about homosexuality. And they contacted me and said, you can't put that in there. I said, well, okay, I'll put in another one. So what I did is I just quoted scriptures that referred to homosexuality. I didn't comment, didn't do anything else. They said, no, you can't do that. In fact, we're kicking you out of the paper. You can't put it in anymore. And that was that. That's what we face. And there are many examples that we could probably recall how that people posting things online or speaking their mind on principles of truth and righteousness that they're being slapped down again and again. And we're seeing that going on now. And my concern is those types of things are going to grow. Don't do what you know is right to do. And it comes from people in power. We have to keep the faith, even when there are penalties in place, Daniel knew what was going to happen. And he continued to do what he knew to be right anyway. His behavior was unchanged. In fact, the expository outlines on the whole Bible says he did not even appear to change. He didn't do it at night. He didn't keep his windows closed. He did exactly what he had done all along. He went up in the day, opened those windows, prayed toward Jerusalem where God dwelt among his people. And he wasn't too busy to do this either. Now something I think is worthy of note, Daniel did not go down to the streets of the capital and protest. He didn't go down there and get in people's faces and cry and moan and whine about what had been done. He just kept doing what was right. He just kept his faith and did exactly what he had done the day before and the day before that and the week before that and the month before that and the year before that. He just kept doing what was right. And these people were angry with him and turned him in because of that great faith. 
We cannot allow the decrees of authorities to stop us from doing what we know is right. Remember Acts chapter 4? Acts chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. That Peter and John, the other apostles, had been arrested. It says in Acts 4, verse 18, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They're not telling them here, you need to forsake the gospel, follow the old law. They're not being told to go and worship idols or anything like that. They're just simply told, don't speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We have to do this. We're compelled to do this. And then when they are rearrested again in Acts chapter 5, remember what Peter responded to them when they were reminded, look, we told you not to do this. We told you not to go out and preach about Jesus. And we told you that we would come against you. That's the idea. In Acts 5 verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. When the governing authorities tell us that we have to stop doing what we know is right, we have to resist. When they tell us stop assembling, they don't have that authority. They don't have that right. When they tell us to stop singing in services, no. We're going to sing because God tells us to sing. We're not going to comply. Just like Daniel did not comply. When they tell us to stop teaching the truth on homosexuality or gender issues or whatever thing and perversion comes up in our society, they tell us to stop. We can't stop. Doesn't matter what the penalty is. Doesn't matter how they threaten us. We have to do what is right. Daniel was in the daily habit of drawing close to God. And when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, God was with him. God was with Paul when he was in prison. God was with Stephen while he was being stoned. And whatever we may face, because of our faith, because we are serving the Lord, we're submitting to His will, God will be with us. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Another thing we learn from Daniel is that we have to be willing to give our all. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. You know, Daniel was willing to die, to pray. Willing to die because he prayed in his home. Think about that. He did not know he would be delivered. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How when they were standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, and how that he said, basically, I'm going to kill you if you don't do this. They said, look, God's able to deliver us, but if not, we're still not going to bow down. They didn't know they would be delivered out of that fire. Daniel, I submit to you, didn't know he'd be delivered out of the den of lions. He knew he would be thrown in there. So he was willing to give his all. In Luke chapter 14, so we think about this idea of loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We have to love God more than others. We have to be willing to take a stand and face the rejection of the people around us. Face the rejection of our friends, of our co-workers, and even of our family. If they become angry over us serving God, then so be it. We need to serve God first. We have to love the Lord our God and serve Him and love Him more than life itself. We have to be willing to lose a job, to go to prison, and to die for the Lord. And what the Lord is telling us here in Luke chapter 14, that if we love our life more than Him, we cannot be His disciple, which means we will not go to heaven. We love others more than we love the Lord, we will not go to heaven. Very strong, very powerful what he says here. So we have to examine ourselves. Do we really love the Lord? Are we willing to give our all? Daniel was willing to give his all, and we need to have that same kind of faith. If you will, open to number 644. 644. And as you're opening there, I want you to consider this. If we could ask Daniel if he could do it all over again, what do you think he would say? If you had an opportunity to go back and make that decision once the decree was written and the law was in place, that if you go and pray to God in heaven, you'll be thrown to the den of lions, would you do the same thing? What do you think his answer would be? Do you think he would say, well, you know, I do have some regrets. I'll look back on that and think, mm, I'm not sure if I really made the right decision there. Or do you think Daniel would say, I have no regrets. I'd make the exact same decision again. I think we know the answer to that. Now let me ask you this. If Daniel had been torn to pieces by the lions, do you think he would give you a different answer? No, he wouldn't. Suppression, oppression, persecution is the way of the world. It runs through the Bible. Daniel is one example of that. And the reason we see that is because Satan is relentless in attacking and striving to destroy the faithful servants of God. And we need to have the faith that we will hold fast to the very end. We need to set an example in our homes, in our communities, in this nation that we are a people that are dedicated to God, it does not matter about the pressure that is brought to bear against us. It doesn't matter what action is taken to suppress us, to intimidate us. We are not going to give in. Our faith is going to be firm. Our service to God is going to be solid. And we are going to honor Him at all cost. So this morning as you look at your life, is there some strengthening that you need to do? Do you need to build up your faith? I would submit to you that all of us, to some degree or another, need to build up our faith. I'm not a prophet, the son of a prophet. But when I look at what's going on, I think we are in for some very difficult and painful times ahead. And as much as we may hate to admit it, our country is not what it was even 10 years ago. It's not. We want to scratch our heads and wonder, well, what, what is going on? Well, what's going on is Satan 
has a majority of people in this nation, the culture is rotting very rapidly and we need to be ready. We need to be resolved now that when that point of decision comes that really we've already made up our mind, we're going to do what's right, and we will gladly accept whatever consequences come with it. So as you think about that, are there things that you need to change in your life? Is there sin that's been eating away at the foundation of faith in your soul? If there is as a child of God, then won't you repent of that and forsake it? Turn back to the Lord. He will extend His mercy to you this morning. And if you're one who's never obeyed the gospel, but you recognize, I need to get my life right with the Lord, then won't you do that this morning? Come and confess Jesus as the Christ. Repent of your sins and be baptized to have your sins washed away. And you can go forth with boldness and faith in the Lord, helping to advance His cause. So if you need to respond, do so while we stand and sing.